SJC 13383, Commonwealth v. Daniel M. Brum. Okay. Attorney Warren, whenever you're ready. Good morning, Chief Justice, and may it please the Court, John Warren on behalf of Daniel Brum. This case implicates foundational evidentiary rules, rules that ensure that the jury base their verdict only on reliable evidence. And that didn't happen here. Rather, the Commonwealth built its case, um, a case where there was no percipient eyewitness on uh, identification against Mr. Brum, on evidence that violated those rules. And these errors, individually, but especially collectively, uh, bootstrapped together, layered on top of each other, rendered the conviction of Mr. Brum unreliable. Before turning to the, the ident Ms. Bizarro's identification, which is an interesting issue, I do want, if I could, I'd like to address the, um, one of the statements that came in through Ms. Bizarro. And there's a number of statements in my second issue in my brief that came in through Ms. Bizarro, any one of which, in a different appeal, could, um, on its own, I think, forcefully um, uh, constitute a, a, a strong appeal. Um, and the first statement was, DB stabbed me. And this was wholly inadmissible under Day and under um, 801 D1A. And that's because the declarant of the statement was Jordan Raposo, and he didn't testify at trial. And uh, he wasn't subject to cross-examination at trial. And that statement, there's, I, I don't think there could be a dispute as to the prejudice of that statement. It's a statement from the non-testifying victim in the case, the only percipient eyewitness in the case, that Mr. Brum did it. And it was wholly admissible coming in through Ms. Bizarro's grand jury testimony. Do you think it was an excited utterance? So. I, I would, that's my second argument, no, that it's, it's not an excited utterance. I assume you're wrong on that one. Assume I'm wrong on that, it's still not admissible under Day, because it's coming in substantively through Ms. Bizarro's grand jury testimony. And the Day rule and 801 D1A, which is titled the declarant witness rule, it's predicated on that concept that the declarant testifies at trial and be subject to cross-examination. And that was Mr. There's no dispute. Mr. Raposo was the declarant of that statement. And it infected the whole trial because it's the statement of this non-testifying person. It's untested evidence. This person did not testify, and it came in substantively. And the jury was, was instructed. Not only were th was there no limiting instruction that this is just impeachment, which it shouldn't have been impeachment evidence anyway, they were instructed to give it its full, um, its full probative value for the truth of the matter, and it infected the whole trial. One of the things about that statement, counsel, that um, I mean, you're 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 arguing that it's inadmissible under the rules, but I wonder what what concerned me more is, isn't that the the Commonwealth says the opposite? But isn't that isn't it testimonial? Isn't that statement testimonial? And and that's the part. Can you can you address that? Because I I just in looking at the analysis of pointing out to who it is that did this to me, uh, I understand the circumstances might say that it's an ongoing emergency, but it would seem to me that, that there's a pretty good argument that it's a testimonial statement. Right. I think, um, I think Your Honor is absolutely right. I think that's the second reason why it shouldn't have come in. And I think Your Honor is also right to say that in, in – in the sense that the day rule contemplates notions of um, confrontation. And so when the day, when day court carved out a pretty broad exception to say, we're not just gonna let in grand jury testimony as impeachment, we're gonna say it's, it's substantive. You can rely on it for the, the truth. That's the subject of, subject of cross-examination component. Right. Right, that's the safety net. Right, that's the safety net. That's the confrontation cause safety net. Exactly, and it's right there in, in 801 D1A, which uh, Day explicitly adopted, and it's called the declarant witness rule. And so to Your Honor's point, baked into that rule is the fact the guy's gotta be there and you get to cross-examine him. But then 
to, to the, the second point about a pure confrontation issue, which is the second argument, this is someone who we know, um, through Ms. Bizarro's testimony, was trying to get her to say that it was Mr. Brum. So the record is, is, is clear that Mr. Raposo wants Brum to be blamed, and for that reason, well, the statement's not, it's testimonial. Well, it's not necessarily clear. That's what Ms. Bizarro says when she tries to distance herself from her grand jury testimony, uh, and certainly Judge Cosgrove didn't buy it, uh, that, that this was something that she, and he makes a determination that she's feigning this for whatever reason. And I think on the, on the flip side though, but what's the evidence that it was um, non-testimonial? Because most of the cases that I reviewed when, when these statements are coming in, there's at least some sort of, you know, there's the case, the Nesbitt case where the judge is parsing certain things come in, certain things don't. The only witness that ever testified about that conversation where D.B. Stabney came out was Ms. Bizarro. But here she is at trial saying she doesn't even remember that statement being made, well, let alone enough factual basis but for I, a I, judge to say it's I, not I, testimony. I, I, I do want to challenge you on that, though, because you've seen the video. You provided it to us. We have testimony from uh, the defendant's mother and brother, I, I think, when, he, when, when the victim comes in to the backyard and collapses. So we have bookends. We have the video of the victim getting into the car driving away after he's been stabbed. We have testimony from other witnesses about appearing on the scene, bleeding profusely and collapsing. So isn't there enough for somebody to suggest or for, for somebody to find that there's an ongoing emergency here within which the, the context when that, when that telephone call comes in? I, I mean, I see your point, but I just su would suggest there's not enough. And you know, Ms. Bizarro, um, when she does talk about that statement at the grand jury, she, she basically says, DB stabbed me and that's it. It wasn't, I need help, um, I'm, I'm going to the hospital, call, call for an ambulance. It was just DB stabbed me, that, that's it. And I, what I would suggest is that's simply not a strong enough factual basis. But assume we think it's an emergency and, and also that um, Judge Cosgrove made proper findings or his findings supported a feigned memory loss. Um, you, you still think your best argument is it's only admissible if it's a declarant and she's not the declarant. Precisely. And, and, and how is that? When you have hearsay within hearsay, the first question is the first layer of hearsay. Right. The first layer of hearsay is whether or not you have a prior statement of um, a, a witness uh, under, under oath who's now testified and subject to cross-examination on the state. All right, so that's the first layer of hearsay. Then you go to the next layer of hearsay. It's, if, it's as if that paper that statement is on is now on the witness stand talking. And that statement now for the second layer of hearsay is that the um, victim said the defendant stabbed him. So the second layer of hearsay if it's satisfied, then you don't have um, a, a, a second hearsay problem. You've got your confrontation clause issue, but the confrontation clause issue involves the excited utterance, not that the adequate declarant on the second level isn't there because both levels are satisfied. Generally, you're right. That's the analysis under totem pole hearsay, but not when it's concerning substantive admissibility of grand jury minutes for the truth. That's, Wait, what's that's your, day. What's your, what's your, what's that's what, day. That's where? day. That's on page 73 of day, and that's, that's 801 D1A, and that's the declarant witness rule. If this was normal totem pole hearsay, fine, but it's under, it has to go through the day rule because that's how it comes in substantively. Well, first of all, it can come in to, under uh, 801 D1A, not just 801, I mean, 801 D1C, not just 801 D1A. That's the same, it has the same predicate, the declarant under conduct lay and the identification rule. Again, the declarant has to be there. If Mr. Raposo had testified at this trial, it, 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 yeah, it, yeah, it identifies the perpetrator of a crime. Right. That's the ID. It, the declarant has to be there. If Mr. Raposo had testified at this trial, this statement could have come in through Ms. Bizarro's grand jury uh, testimony for the truth, but he wasn't there. 
So you're saying for grand jury testimony, the rules are different under day. Substantive. And the, the regular rules of totem pole hearsay don't apply. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And, and if I could turn to the identification uh, issue. Because the line from day that says that? It's, it's on page 73. And, and it's, 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 it is the 80, they adopt the 801 D1A but, but, rule, which, so which says the declarant needs to be there and needs to be subject to cross examination. If I remember correctly, 73, are you, is that the, the, the footnote? That you're no. Not, no, no, that's not the footnote. That's hey, that's in the text of day on page 73. Can you tell me the, the, the language if you if you have it? Because the declarant they're referring to is the declarant who testified <coughs> grand jury. I would that's I would suggest that's not the that's not the reading of Dick. That's not declarant. That's not how. Is day is, they, is day a um, a uh, hearsay within hearsay case? It isn't. It isn't. But that that's. So they're obviously referring to the, to the, the person at the grand I would jury. suggest that's, that's that not how declarant is used. Of, in a, in a uh, because hearsay within hearsay case, what might be meant by declarant when it's not a hearsay within hearsay case? So the rule itself, is, it's not, it's the declarant witness rule. Sure, sure. It's the but reason that it's not just saying. saying day is what says it can't be the circumstance we have here. But Day factually is distinct from the circumstance we have here. And the declarant in Day was clearly the person testifying at the grand jury. And, and if, you, if you extend that, it's Ms. Bizarro. I would and Ms. Bizarro's on the stand subject to cross-examination. I would suggest if you look at the, the meaning of declarant sorry. in the rules. I'm sorry. I think this is something we're going to have to go back and look at, and we'll keep what your position is in mind. But let's move on to the next thing. If, if, can I ask you on the next thing? Because um, you, you make a, um, an argument about, which was very interesting, about identification. Is it identification as, you know, the neighbor sees the, the shooting and then calls the police, right? Classic identification, as opposed to watching a video and identifying. Is all that necessary if we look at it as an 801DA um, statement as opposed to C? Um, it's, so her identification is, is a lay, it's an opinion. Right. It's an opinion. But it's, it's still a statement in front of the grand jury that's feigned. So can we just cut out with this and just look at it under the first exception and, and then no, because she's not a fact witness, and, and, and it's, it's opinion evidence, and that's the carve out in pleas. And that's, pleas is specifically under 701. And it's the reason, it's an exception really to fact witnesses coming in and saying what they heard and what they saw. The exception is for identifications, um, this narrow holding on opinions. But we still have the overlay and, of this grand jury, substantive use of the grand jury, right? It's still, I would suggest it's still an opinion. It's still under pleas, and it's under 701. Um, and that's the only way it comes in. And, and that makes a statement of identification under, under subsection C, under your view. Uh, it, it's it's an not, opinion. Not, it's not. No, it's not. not. No, I'm sorry, it's I not. misspoke. Not, exactly. a, not a statement of identification. Exactly. It's, it's an opinion on identification. And, and please carves out this exception. It's not a fact witness. It's saying you're going to give an opinion. And the reason that Ms. Bizarro's... Um, opinion was unreliable and inadmissible is, first of all, her opinion was contaminated from the outset. Before she ever made an identification, uh, even on the Commonwealth's case, she, was, she heard that it was Mr. Brum who did it. That's before she ever looks at um, a you video from or the photograph. victim? From the victim. Mm -hmm. Then we have a video which is angled and distant, and you can't clearly see the person's face or any distinguishing characteristics. Is and the then you, victim, then you, is, I'm sorry, is, is the stabber walking he's, in the video? The perpetrator's jogging on the video. Okay, and, so and he's moving. He's moving, and, and you know. You say that that's why, why she can tell well, uh, in, who it is because he has a distinctive, I thought it was a walk, but yeah. No, you're, I mean, you're right. What she says is walk. Yeah. The person's jogging on the video. Interestingly, the first ID she ever makes is from a still photograph. So it's not even a moving image, but then and you go to knows, then you I'm go sorry, to. She knows the defendant for fifteen. Years. Right, she, clearly familiarity, but that's not enough. And and so you go to what her actual reasons were for making this ID at grand jury. She says it's, 
um, the walk and the clothes. Well, the clothes were completely nondescript. The walk, this person's not, the person's jogging on the video, mm -hmm. and the first ID she ever makes is from a photograph still. And then what and, and is that missing you're saying in, goes to admissibility as opposed to just common variety cross-examination? It does, because it's not helpful to the jury. And, and what else is missing in her grand jury testimony is this is evidence that's going to give the jury the tools to make their own assessment. That's, that's helpfulness under 701 and please. So what, to what extent do we defer to Judge Cosgrove's uh, findings on this? So um, I would think it would be abuse of discretion. Um, but, it, and it, but it's simply not helpful. You look at what's the I, factual. I don't understand what you mean. It's not helpful if we're looking at in, the, in relation to the standard. It's not, well, that's the standard under 701 evidence, opinion evidence. It needs to help the jury decide he, a fact. He's made that determination that it is helpful because he's made specific findings about that the video itself is clear enough, uh, it's certainly to him, and that's the video that she looked at. Isn't that explicit, if not implicitly, saying that this would be helpful to the identification along with all the other identification evidence? And what I'm saying is that that, that was... You know, he erred there. He erred. He got it wrong. And the factual basis for Ms. Bazaar's opinion, as contained in her grand jury minutes, she says the walk and she says the clothes, but there's no description about what it is about the walk, what it is about the clothes, that would let a jury make their own assessment, as we usually have in these cases when someone actually comes into court and gives live testimony. This is an opinion witness. This is supposed to be helping the jury out. And what actually happened at trial is... I get on the pleas. We, we don't want the police officers to say, I'm super witness and that's Joe Smith, mm -hmm. right? We, we, we don't want that. And we said, no, let the jury do that. And, or let someone who knows this person do that. And we have that here and a judge makes a determination. And this video and, and still that I looked at is certainly a lot better than the video that we had in Justice Lowy's case on, on the... Um, for, on the the name's escaping me. Davis. Davis. It's a lot better than the Davis blurry mess. Well, uh, so shouldn't this just go to the jury? You know, I don't think and, the and video. Let him, and it's just as well. Let's suggest this. That's that's what we have cross examination for. So first, I would say the video. It's not that it's pixelated or or extremely blurry. It's that it's distant and angled. You can't see the person's face and you can't make out distinguishing characteristics. Right, which is why somebody who's known this person for 15 years might be helpful uh, to the jury in assessing from this distance. Not Isn't from, that what Judge not from that, found? Not from that video, not with the, reason, the lack of reasons in her grand jury, and not when she actually gets to trial and says, I don't know who that person is. It could be any average white guy. So, so the video's gonna, unclear. We're, so we're gonna let, we're gonna let uh, Witnesses just lie on the stand and perjure themselves. It, the evidence has to be helpful to the jury. And in the form it came in, where the, you know, this is, a, again, it's a carve out for opinion evidence. Yeah. So you're saying it's basically so inherently unreliable that the judge abused his discretion in saying it would be helpful. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, and if, I know my time is up, if I could turn to the prosecutor's request for identification. What I'm gonna do is ask um, if anyone has questions on that particular issue. Okay, I'm Thank sorry. you, I would ask that this court grant Mr. Brum a new trial. Great, thank you. Okay, Attorney Nato. Thank you, again, Madam Chief Justice, and again, may it please the court, Steve Nato on behalf of the Commonwealth. Um, I would suggest that this case represents the rules of evidence. First aggressor in this case. <laughs> 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 Withdrawn. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, but, um, but again, this case too represents the rules of evidence embodied in Day and Conduct Lee working flexibly and as well. Do you read Day the same way as your opposing counsel that for purposes of grand jury minutes, uh, they can only come in if, or the, the garden variety, totem pole, heel say rules don't apply? I, I do disagree. And I would suggest this court disagreed in Commonwealth versus Dapina, where it applied the traditional layered he hearsay rule to an adoptive admission. Okay, so you think in Day when they talk about the declarant, they're just talking about whoever testified before the right. grand jury. Yes. Okay. Who's 
you know, whether they're recanting or making new inconsistent statements, whose prior statements are you There's admitting only one in? There's declarant from Jay that, that they could have been referring. Correct. I'm sorry? There's only one declarant from Jay yes. that they could Yes, well, that too, correct. Um, and I, Commonwealth versus Santiago is a uh, case I know I cite it in my brief. It's part of the excited utterance stuff. Um, but in a footnote, they talk about layered hearsay being applied to excited utterance. It's also not in the day context. But again, it seems fairly um, unremarkable at this point um, on that piece of it. As to the um, identification issue my brother left off, uh, I would suggest while there's no case directly on point in Massachusetts, uh, there are indications that uh, the way her opinion tes testimony on identification was admitted is sort of unremarkable and has found acceptance um, in Massachusetts. Um, the earliest one dealing with the exact issue that I could find was United States versus Ingram. Uh, that's a 10th Circuit case. Uh, where kind of the main issue they were, sorry? Was that 40 something years ago? Yes. Uh, <laughs> let me ask you um, uh, what the, this is how the appellant started uh, quite well with a very interesting point and then got away from it, which is the problem here is the lack of evidentiary foundation that, the, that we're trying to determine the foundation for a lay witness or the foundation for a spontaneous explanation from uh, grand jury minutes, not from testimonial trial, and that we don't really have the foundation leaping off the pages of the grand jury to establish that. That was his, that's how he started this argument, and, and, it's, and he may, I don't know where it comes out, but it's a good point. Well, I think there is more than just the grand jury minutes as to those two things. I, I think the what is persuasive about a lay ID is what's the basis of their familiarity. Here, and she did testify about some of this at trial. She was a difficult witness, obviously. But I've known him for 15 years. He grew up in the same streets, went to school with his brothers, that kind of thing. Um, and that, she, again, was part of the trial testimony, not just the grand jury. Um, evidence, and certainly as to the excited utterance aspect of it, um, I think there's ample evidence of what was going around at that time. You know, uh, Andrew Brum, his wife, their cousin, uh, sees the victim kind of stumbling to their backyard, bleeding uh, from serious injuries uh, to his nether regions, uh, kind of losing consciousness, unable to hold himself up. Um, and minutes later, Shyla Bizarro shows up, and she's freaking out. Um, so there is some independent uh, grounding for the reliability of um, What about thing. the confrontation issue with, with DR stabbed me or DR did this? What about the confrontation issue? Well, I, I think the confrontation issue, certainly the uh, evidence is testimonial, is grand jury testimony. Uh, but I think the confrontation clause is satisfied by having the declarant there no, no. Cross the, the, de the declarant wasn't there. The declarant was the victim, so he didn't testify. Oh. I'm talking about yes. what, what about if, if that statement, uh, DR did this to me or what a DR did it, is, is testimonial without having the, 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 the person there, what about the, what about the confrontation issue? Well, I think confrontation... Do you, well, let me just start you fundamentally. Do you think it's a testimonial statement? No. Okay. The excited utterance is not a testimonial statement. No, I think the evidence kind of, the timing of everything pretty mm -hmm. sh clearly shows that's a spontaneous um, reaction to getting stabbed. Well, that's the, that's the evidence part. That's the, that's the rules, of, that's the, 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 the exception part. I'm talking about the Sixth Amendment part, the, the confrontation part. Well, I think generally when excited utterance comes in, sometimes in domestic violence cases where the victim may sort of a fifth, the... Um, Declaration is not there to be cross-examined, and that doesn't raise um, a confrontation issue if the statements, if the excited utterances are not um, testimonial, uh, which it wasn't here. Um, and, and so long as, you know, the layered hearsay stuff all checks out, I, I don't think there's a confrontation issue beyond that. Um, sorry, where were we? <laughs> 
Um, I think what you're trying to say is that the fact that the um, excited utterance, if the foundation for the excited utterance is satisfied, um, uh, then at least in this context where the law enforcement is not involved, it's hard to think that it's a statement that's intended to be a substitute for trial testimony. Right. It's, you know, certainly unlikely that the victim here was going to call his girlfriend afterwards and be like, now is the time right. to get Daniel Brum for something he didn't do. Um, if, the, if the excited utterance foundation... Right, correct. Um, and then that should come in under day. Um, what about that issue of uh, the police officer blowing up uh, the surveillance photo to be able to see the um, license plate number in a way that the jury never did? So I, I would say about that, um, it was not ideal the way it came out. In this case, the prosecutor discovered um, this during the cross-examination of that officer. Um, but I did check with the prosecutor, uh, ADA Gilderson, and he confirmed with the police that they do have this new technology, it has a name, I forget what it's called, but they can sort of zoom in and clarify and enhance. Um, but it, we don't, obviously that's not really part of the record here. Um, but to the extent there are concerns there, I think uh, the jury could you know, give weight to the officer's testimony, whether or not that was true. Certainly I, the prosecutor during his redirect uh, I don't have the page right in front of me, but in the transcript, he kind of goes, look at this video we're watching right now. Uh, you can't see a Florida license plate in that video, can you? So I think there were steps made to sort of um, reduce any prejudice that might have been. Uh, Counsel, but, uh, the, the rental contract, I know there was a stipulation. Did the rental contract come in and did that, I don't remember if, it, if that denoted what the, the vehicle agreement? was. Yeah, yes, with, yes, with that. the vehicle and whether it had a license plate and whether it was a Florida yes, license but plate. The stipulation was as to um, that he was renting the car that they found on the street the day after, not that he sure. was renting the car that was in the video. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously there were other um, confirming aspects in the video that it was a rental car that was out of state, so there was no front license plate. So those details, uh, you know, corroborated and made up for this sort of missing Florida license plate thing that the jury couldn't judge themselves. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are no other questions on that issue. I'll return um, back to the identification uh, issue coming in under uh, Dye and Conduct Lee as lay opinion testimony. And uh, I think it was you who pointed out uh, United States versus Ingram is about 40 years old, yes, but uh, the appeals court relied on that case in part when they decided please um, to sort of reinvigorate the uh, lay opinion testimony. Um, and this court um, in Commonwealth versus Hobbs, which is a first degree murder case um, where uh, some improperly admitted evidence was not prejudicial because of um, a brother's seriatim identifications of his brother based on surveillance video at the police station, at grand jury testimony, and then of course he um, recants that identification at trial. Um, and that issue wasn't specifically raised, but um, under 33E, uh, this court apparently was not troubled by it. So I, I think that's what I meant by saying that there are indications that this is kind of an acceptable pra practice. And it's not so much that it, it, it's uh, within grand jury minutes, although I know the defendant made that argument, it said is, is considering Cuomo versus Davis, and it, it, is this appropriate lay opinion? Under Cuomo versus? But, well, we, we, we've said certain video, surveillance video is not, like in Davis. Um, it, is, is this permissible uh, lay opinion to have the witness look mm -hmm. and, and the grand jury witness as it, as it turned out? and say, yeah, this is Mr. Defendant? I, I, I think so, and certainly the suggestive circumstances uh, that may have preceded the victim telling her who did it, um, I think may play part into the... 
I'm sorry? Which way does that cut? Depending on the circumstance, could make it more unreliable as too unduly suggestive under fairness principles is, um, to be admitted. Is that, is that a gatekeeping function of the trial judge? If you have a Davis blurry video to keep it out? Yes, I think there's that. If it's kind of so unreliable, it shouldn't be. Then it's just not relevant. Right. If it's so blurry, right? Um, and, and or if the video quality is like, I don't believe anyone can identify mm -hmm. uh, someone in this video. All those kind of questions that precede admissibility. But those are also questions that the jury has to figure out for that's themselves. Something, that's something that the trial judges can do. Right. So judge um, Cosgrove thought this, was, this one was good enough. Right. Um, and, and the judge instructed them on this. You have to consider their, the nature of their familiarity to look at the video um, and to the extent that there are real liability concerns about um, letting in lay opinion I IDs under day um, I think that is sort of a key distinction uh, between eyewitness identifications and the kind of I ID that was at issue here because for the most part with eyewitness IDs you don't have the event running in the background that you can kind of look at and say yep that looks like a good ID to me no that looks like a bad one uh, here. The jury could look at the video, which as the judge found was a pretty good quality, not great given uh, the reasons I would describe, distance, angle, uh, that sort of thing. But I think a jury could look at this video and say, someone that knew this guy for 15 years, grew up with him essentially, I think they could uh, see this guy at different points in the video. Um, and I think she gave a pretty holistic uh, basis for that. Uh, but the jury didn't live, grow up with the guy. What about having the jury uh, rely on the video to ID him? I, I think the jury has to rely on, or look to the video themselves. They can't just blindly. Oh, of course, but that you'll be able to tell it's him from the video. Wasn't that sort of a suggestion in the closing? I mean, I, I think the video was reasonably. By the defense. Sorry? It certainly was a suggestion by the defense that they didn't need the testimony. That's, that's true, yes. Um, and that was in Lemonade, too. That this video is unmistakably clear. We don't need mm. this opinion coming in. Um, Counsel, could I ask you to just, to, before your time runs out, address this other kind of one step up argument that, that your brother makes about the concept or definition of what a percipient witness is, in that uh, because Ms. Bizarro didn't, was in the percipient witness to the actual stabbing, that she can't be a percipient witness for purposes of making the identification on the surveillance. And I know that he was relying on that footnote. Um, you say that, it, that, that, it, that footnote is not necessarily helpful because uh, you mentioned to the events in question relate to the circumstances of making the ID, not the actual act, criminal act. Right. What what other what cases do you have to support that? If you if you if you because that was a big deal, I thought, um, for you to say that, or, and and for the other way, is well, there anything that you have that supports that formulation of what uh, to the events in question means when it comes to percipients? Well, certainly there's I, not exactly on the same issue, but there's that unpublished appeals court decision that's cited where you know it's not an eyewitness to the events of the crime identifying the perpetrator. Um, so already you're kind of getting away from uh, direct percipients, although in that case, it was a witness who saw the culprit running away shortly after. Any federal cases? United States versus Ingram, I okay. think is uh, the best one. Um, and I don't know if it's just because it, again, seems so unremarkable that it's never really uh, reiterated, but at least even then it seemed like it was acceptable enough that the main issue they were deciding was does a lay ID opinion come in under 701? And then a footnote, oh, by the way, that comes in under uh, Rule 801, uh, prior testimonies, or prior ID. Um, are there no other questions?